Thank you for the day. We thank you so much for the opportunity we have together again, and Father, the opportunity to just raise ourselves and our voices up in praise to you. Father, today that's what we want to do, is to praise and honor and adore you. We pray that, uh, Father, everything we do and say we please you for you today. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. He will bring me out into the light. I will see his righteousness. Micah 7 9.
proudly took each emblem, just like we do. But it was what happened in a few minutes that stole my heart. He quickly came back to where I was seated, and what he said to me was, I got it. I finally got it. He was very excited because he's never been offered communion. But you could see in his face and hear in his voice that he was excited. The first thought through my mind was, uh oh, because I think, I believe that only baptized believers should take the emblems acknowledging communion with God. And I emphasize, I think, I believe. But this is not the focus of my meditation. Here I was with the excitement of him doing this for the first time. And even if he didn't totally understand what this was, he knew it was important and it was good. In a few minutes, my communion was served to me as he sat next to me. So I decided this would be a good teaching opportunity. So as I held on to each of my emblems as they were passed, I explained to Taylor the meaning of breaking the bread and, and why we use the emblem and the drinking of the wine um, and its emblem. He was very serious as I talked and seemed to understand everything I said. I used this opportunity to try to teach him about community. Taylor has been coming to this church ever since he got out of the hospital in 1999. So he's been coming to Children's Church basically since he was about four. And I just want to say God bless our teachers who teach our young children about Jesus. The focus of my meditation today is the excitement that he felt when he was served communion. He knows we do it every Sunday. He knows he doesn't get it. And as I said, he couldn't wait to tell me that he got it. But are we that excited when we have communion with God? As educated adults, many baptized believers, some still contemplating accepting Jesus as your Savior, Savior some who have accepted but may feel distant from Jesus right now. And maybe some who are hearing the word of God for the first time. Is this how we feel when we break the bread, when we drink of the wine as a remembrance of his broken body and his spilled blood? Do we feel the excitement of, I got it, every time we meet Jesus at the table? Today is the emblem surpassed. Examine your heart and your soul to see what these emblems mean to you. As this is my body for which I do, I do this in, do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Paraphrase from 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. Today, allow your heart to freely experience the excitement when you meet Jesus at the table. Feel the I got it privilege in communion with God. Thank you.
Let's bow our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to the table today in your honor to remember your Son who sacrificed himself on the cross. Some of us have come for the first time to your table. Some of us have been there many times. Each of us have examined ourselves and we humble ourselves. We thank you for the sacrifice that your Son made for us, that we are able to eat at your table. And we look forward to the day when we're all together again at your table to sing praise and to remember you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you today uh, for the gifts that you have given us, and we are blessed to return them back to you. We thank you for the ability to do so, that you continue to bless us each and every day. And we thank you that our, and we um, hope that our portion goes back and works in a way more than we uh, expect. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
saying before people before. Saying <coughs> hymns about America at home is what they said. If I can tell, how did he end up? He had no idea where he was looking or what he was doing. Who was he singing to? God. Yeah. And he said, I, I want to see you. John chapter 9. John chapter 9. We're going to tear it apart. And we're going to kind of rush through the first 46 verses. Okay? If you can do that so we can get to where I want to be in, in the message today. John chapter 9. Starts off this way. As he went chapter, uh, verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with, the, with his saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to a saloon and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such a miraculous sign? So they were divided. Finally they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this one you say that was born blind? How is it now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he, had, he was born blind. But how he can see now or whom opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why the parents said, He is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, What did you do? What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurried, hurled insults at him and said, You are the fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know what we know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. 
How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he had found him, said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I might believe in him. Then Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this, and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. <coughs> Interesting story, isn't it? What was the first question asked? Who sinned? Lord, Lord, who sinned that this man might be born blind? See, their belief back then was that sin could be handed down generation to generation. They, they might have even thought that because they believed the Spirit existed before man, that the sin was already in the Spirit when the man was born because of prior sins. And Jesus says, and says, no one sinned. Why is the man blind? What did He say? So that God's glory could be worked out. The man's blind for this very purpose and reason here right now. What was the purpose and reason? So he could teach the people. What was the point Jesus was trying to make here? What was he going to teach them? I am the Son of God. Quote then, I am Jesus. I am the Christ. I am He. It's a teaching moment. It's a moment when this guy's eyes were opened. Now, Physically, they were open. Blind from birth, he could now see. Can you imagine the excitement? Can you imagine he went to the pool of Siloam and, and he took the water and he washed his eyes and when he cleared, he looked and he saw things he never saw before. Can you imagine the excitement? I can imagine it. I can imagine the words. So act. I got it. <laughs> got it. And in the story, Jesus opened his eyes a second time. You see, the guy got physical sight, and the Pharisees and the people were asking him about it and questioning him because it was done on the Sabbath, and we don't do things on the Sabbath. Do any of you do things on the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. yeah. But because he did not have they were just like in a boil. Like, well, we can't do things that. Certainly, this guy's a sinner because he didn't obey the Sabbath. And this guy's like, but could anybody other than God do this? Kind of his question. And because he threw it back on them, oh, you want to be disciples too? What a clever question. Can you imagine the Pharisees shuddering and saying, well, get out of here. You know, they threw him out. When Jesus heard he threw him out, Jesus went to him again. And listen here. When Jesus came to him again, he opened his eyes. What did he open his eyes to the second time? To see Jesus. Now, there's the part of the sermon I want to give you. I once was blind, but now I see with the words of the man. Folks, I was born blind. And you were born blind. We were born into this world as beings, and as beings we were made to want God. We're made to, to relish in Him and, and enjoy Him. But it was left up to 
us free will, free choice. And there were people in life that came to you and mentioned the name Jesus. And mentioned God and your free will allowed you to either accept or to deny what they told you. Just as these Pharisees were able to either accept or deny what this man was telling them about how he came to see you. And in all of our lives, we come to a point where we have to make a decision. I heard enough about this Jesus. I heard enough about this God and, and the Holy Spirit. I heard enough about what's going on there. And now I've come to this point in, in this crux of my life that I either go left or I go right. I either believe and accept or I walk away. The man here had to make a decision. And Jesus said, do you know who this God is? I don't know. Tell me that I might believe, the man says. Jesus says, I am Him. And what did the man do? Worship. It says, the man believed and worshipped Him. And gang, we come to a point in our lives that, that we have to look at it. Do I believe or do I not? And if you believe, you what? Action. Action. Worship. And I don't think... This is me. Listen to a post. I don't think that when he said the man worshipped him, it was this. I can imagine this guy falling down on his face and worshiping and saying, thank you, God, thank you. Because, A, he was blind and now he sees. Both physically and now spiritually. It isn't a corporate worship that he's talking about here. It's an individual, Lord, I now see. And as I was studying this, looking through this, I wondered, do we have the ability to see God and then we believe? Or do we have to believe in order to see God? And most scholars believe this. That it is upon your confession and your burial that you receive sight. Just as a man had to wash his eyes, we wash ourselves to be given sight. Yes, we could know of God. We can know of Jesus, but to truly know them, we have to believe and accept. And then the vision comes. How many of you, when you were baptized, knew it all? <laughs> so the division didn't come? Yeah. The vision came. This man saw Jesus, fell down, and worshipped Him. The vision was there. He saw Jesus for who He was. And for us, we could do the same. But, in my sermon I called it blinders. Ever work with a horse? Where do horses go? Wherever a horse wants to go. <laughs> Horses go. In order to direct them sometimes, in order to, to plow the straight line and fill stuff like this, what do farmers and people working with horses do? The blinders. To focus them on this path, not what's out here. Because they can be walking along and all of a sudden, hey, look at there. <laughs> That's their nature. So they put blinders on. I think we make a big mistake and, and when we accept Christ, we immediately put blinders on. The only problem is, is we don't know how to put them on. We read things in the Bible and we're like, uh, I don't think I can believe that. Really, Samson took a jawbone of a donkey and killed 10,000 men? Be serious with me, okay? You think that could happen? All things can happen through Christ. Through God? I mean, 
People say all the time, my God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I love to tell them, oh, it's a shame you limit him there. My Lord owns the hills too. You know, take the blinders off and allow to see God for who He is and for everything He has. Allow yourself to see what He has for you. You know, yes, we need blinders on this path. This path that gets us from here, point A, to heaven, point B. Blinders for that purpose, but not blinders on who God is and the power and ability He has in our lives. You see, we're blind to all kinds of things. I was blind to cancer. I was. When he says, when he says I have cancer, okay, we'll pray for you. Other people like cancer, and until it really affects you, it doesn't affect you, does it? I have heart problems. I'll pray for you. But until it affects you, it doesn't affect you, does it? And once it affects you, then you have this new sight of what it is. And it's any anything in life. You know, anything. We don't know about it until we know about it. And through our experiences, we get caught. Two different things. It's through the fire that steel is strengthened, right? And so in my sight, I'm going to have hard times. I'm going to have bad times. I'm going to have down times. Because it's through those times that God is strengthening me to see Him better. When I'm afflicted, where do I lean? Where do I go for the strength? How do we handle some of the things we do? It's God. Right? Marilyn, Marilyn's here today. I feel for her in the loss of her daughter, in the loss of her father. In the loss of a daughter, I have no clue. I, I say, I feel for you. I have no clue. I have not lost a child. I've lost a father. I, I know what that's like, and so there I can sympathize. With it. But to do some of those things, until we get our eyes open to some of that stuff that it affects us personally, sometimes we don't know. Gang, the question is this. Has God affected you personally? Have you moved up knowing of God to knowing God? You see, if He hasn't affected you, if it hasn't made a difference in your life, you know what? If it's the reason that you breathe and you live and you do what you do every day, you know Him. We allow things in our lives to affect us every day. We allow people to affect us. We allow situations to affect us. And what we have to do is, when we get our sight, allow God to affect the situations. To allow God to affect the people. To have Him have the main ring, not other things and other people. I think Taylor got it. The innocence of a child like that. The excitement in his life. I mean, I, Crystal's telling about it, I could feel it. I wasn't here last week. I didn't see him come running back to her. I could see it. I know Taylor, and I, I can see him when he gets excited. When, when there's something about him, you know it, don't you? I mean, sometimes he comes up to me, and he, he can't get it out fast enough. And I'm going, yeah. <laughs> but you get it. And that excitement. And for him to get the words out, I got it. I don't think he means I got it. I got the juice in the cup. That could be part of it, but I think he understood it. Crystal said when she explained it to him, he was he was there. He was locked into that conversation. He was, he was a part of it. He allowed it, God, to 
to affect him. He won't ever be the same because of it. Just as when God affects us, when we get our sight and our vision, it affects us. Now, did you hear what God said at the end of this? What Jesus, when He was speaking, said? Let me read His words again. If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. What does that mean? We, we like to say the age of innocence. Do you understand the age of innocence? Birth to a certain age. Kids really don't know sin and not sin. Right and wrong. But when you start understanding and developing that sense of right and wrong and sin, you, you remember the first time you did something and you knew you did wrong? Or how about this past week you did something and you knew it was wrong? You had that feeling about it? You're no longer blind. And if you're not blind, your sin remains in you. But there's a way to get rid of that sin. And it's by the one that this guy saw. Why did he fall down and worship him when he said, I am he? When he said, you are looking at him now. Why did he fall down and worship him? Because he's what? Grateful. He was grateful. Believe. Grateful, thankful. Because he believed. Tell me who the man is that I might believe. And as soon as he heard, he believed. He, he was grateful for what he was given, sight, but now more so grateful because he was given Christ. How grateful are you for Christ? Does it cause you just in the middle of somewhere just to, to fall down and worship with Him? When He reveals more to you in your sight, does it cause you to stand up and say, I got it? I mean, I, I read scriptures all the time. I, I read them when I was a kid. I read them in college and studied them. And still when I read them, all of a sudden it's like a light bulb goes off. It's like, I have read that scripture 20 times, 30 times. And I always thought it was this. And all of a sudden... It's this. I opened up my blinders a little more and God revealed to me another truth. And what do you do with that truth? Oh, that was nice. I'll tuck that away for a rainy day. Spread it. You share it. This guy, when he saw Jesus and found out, when he saw him and knew who he was, could not hold back his worship for this man. We have a choice. Blinders on, blinders off. We could see Jesus for who he is and what he is and what he could do to change our lives and situations, or we could walk away. We were talking in the Sunday school class about studying Revelations and what it's all about and doing different things. And, you know, when he said, talk about the church of Laodicea, he says, you know, it's the middle of the road. And I explained to them what our Bible college professors explained to us, what middle of the road was. She said, a minister that she grew up with said, here it is. Timeline, 1 to 10. Where are you in your Christian life? From 1 to 10, where are you? So I'm going to ask you, on a timeline of 1 to 10, where are you? Put a number in your head. Stick to that number. How many of you are a 1? Ice cold. How many of you are a 10? 
Smoke it hot. How many of you are somewhere in between two through nine? Our professor said one cold, <coughs> ten hot. Scripture says if you're anything else, you're in the middle, you're lukewarm. <laughs> what does Jesus do or God do with lukewarm? Spews them out of his mouth. Gang, when you get your vision, get the vision. You have got to be ten all the time. You've got to be hot, sold out for that. It's got to be there in you and living. It's got to be a part of you the things you do. Because you're either a 1 or a 10. The rest is middle, lukewarm, and worthless to God. So what vision do you have? What has God made you? From your own admittance, other than one smart man who raised his hand, you have work to do, don't you? You have blinders on that need to be opened up. You have things you need to get rid of in your life in order to get more of God that you can be a smoking hot man. And I don't mean sexy like me. <laughs> I mean hot for Christ. Totally sold out to Him. His and His alone, no matter what comes your way. This boy opened the eyes of my heart, Lord, that I might see you. And I told Dawn, when I, when I watched that first time, she, she showed me, she came across the back of the She says, look at this. And we watched the whole thing. Go, go YouTube it. It's nine minutes long. We didn't show you the whole thing. At the beginning, it shows you where they are and what it is, and a man sets up the whole thing. This boy here and what it's all about. And I said, when you when you watch the whole thing, you know this. A, he only sang that song for God. It didn't matter who else was in that room. You could tell that when he ended up turning his back on them and sang. Two. It wasn't just a song. It was a prayer. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, that I might see You. Complete You. That I might get it so I can live it. That's what the song was. I mean, watch it and listen to it. Read this Scripture over and over and look. This man received physical sight. Later he received his spiritual sight to see Jesus of who he was and he immediately fell down to worship Him. Man, we have Jesus in our lives. We have Him in our all being. We need to daily fall down and worship Him. We need to worship Him first thing in the morning because He gave us another day of life when we stepped foot on our floor and got out of that bed. We need to worship Him during the day because He sees us through it and takes care of us. You see these wrecks all around you, different things like that that you just nearly miss, and different things like that? There's a reason. We need to praise Him at night because He took us through another day and kept us safe and from harm. And we need to praise Him for using us in His magnificent plan. A minute me to be able to stand here and give you His Word. Praise Him for that. Because he doesn't have to use me. He can use anybody else. But I get that privilege. And every day you get the same privilege as he uses you in life to touch and change lives for him. Fall down and worship him because of that. Fall down and worship him because you have your sight. Your spiritual sight to see him. So today we're going to sing a hymn of invitation and all of you admit it, you need it. <coughs> all of you said I'm somewhere between two and nine. So you have an opportunity to, to, to say to God, God, here I am. I think I'm a six. 
helped me this week to be a seven. Wherever you are with him in your walk, if you have claimed him as yours, ask him to make you better. Ask him to allow you to see him more. Again, if you're here, and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and maybe today's the day that when we sing this song, you say, you know what? I need that vision. I need that sight of Him because what I'm doing isn't coming. I'm not making it through on this. I need Him to guide, direct, and lead me to what you have to do. Whatever your decision today, if you have a decision to make, as we sing a song, we make that decision, whether it's the first time or to get redirected back to His vision. As we stand and sing.
follow that, that he may lead you to those that need him. We have to be about seeking and saving the lost. I mean, there's, there's no better time than now. In the world, look at the shape it's in. So, this week, we've got to be kids. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you so much for our ability to each be here this morning. Father, to sing praises and worship and praise you. And Father, to love you. Father, we just pray that today we made you proud. That you saw our love and our adoration for you. And that, Father, you, you can take that and, and revel in it. And Father, now use us. Give us the vision you have for us this week that we might see those places you'd have us to go and do those things you have us to do that others may come to see you. Father, we pray this in your Son's name. Amen.